Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Alex Thier, and I'm the executive director here at the Overseas Development Institute. Welcome. Uh, welcome not only to ODI today, but to a very exciting week in London. Uh, all the heads of uh, government for the Commonwealth are in town, as I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, many exciting events both here uh, and around town, uh, but we are really thrilled that you are here in person with us today. We also have a number of people online. Uh, we have an exciting opportunity today uh, to hear about Australia's vision for international development. And we are honored to be joined by Australia's Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Kinshenta Firavanti Wells. Welcome. Uh, she's going to open us in a few minutes with a keynote speech, uh, and then we will have a panel discussion uh, we, that I will be chairing, and we will also be joined by Albert Mariner, uh, who is joining us as the head of Asia, Europe, Caribbean, and Pacific, <laughs> if you can get all of that, from the political section at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And we're happy to have Albert here, particularly given the relevance of his job uh, for this week. Uh, as I said, we have people uh, joining us not only here in the audience today, but from around the world. And indeed, if you are here uh, or watching online, uh, although we do ask you to silence your phone, please don't turn it off. Uh, it is a good way to join the conversation. Uh, we're using the hashtag today, ODI AUSAID, A-U-S-A-I-D, or our handle, uh, at ODI Dev. Uh, so you can join the discussion. You can also submit questions online uh, for the discussion to follow the speech. Uh, but first, we are going to hear uh, from our keynote speaker, uh, Senator Firavanti Wells. She is the Minister for International Development and the Pacific in Australia's federal coalition government. She has served as a senator from New South Wales since 2005. Prior to this position, she was Assistant Minister for Multicultural Affairs and had a wide portfolio of responsibilities uh, ranging from the Attorney General's Office to Immigration and Border Protection and indeed social services. So a great array of experience, both domestically and internationally, which is always a welcome addition to the dialogue here. So please join me in welcoming the Senator. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. And uh, let me begin by thanking the Overseas Development Institute for hosting us uh, here today. Um, this afternoon, I would like to focus on three important areas, namely the substantial work that Australia and the UK already do together, the opportunity to work more together post-Brexit, and the role of the Commonwealth in international development and the scope for greater involvement, um, which will be part of uh, um, the panel discussion. I'm pleased to be here at this momentous time in the lead up to such an important chogum, a new world order and change of focus in the United Kingdom from its closest neighbours to a more expansive view, which we hope will result in a renewed partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. A post-Brexit Britain and Australia must look at greater opportunities and partnerships. Some of the fastest growing countries are in the Commonwealth, creating so many new opportunities for all of us in the family of 53 nations. And with so many different aspects of our political, economic and cultural life, Australia and the UK also have a shared perspective uh, when it comes to Overseas Development Assistance, or ODA. We have $3 billion worth in joint projects. For decades, we have worked together with the common aim of using ODA to contribute to stability, security and prosperity for all. More than ever, we need to work more closely together. Australia's recent foreign affairs policy white paper 
guides our international efforts, reinforcing the importance of Australia's ODA as a powerful tool to support a stable, secure and prosperous neighbourhood. Indeed, 90% of our ODA uh, of about $4 billion is spent in the Indo-Pacific region, with a third of that directly in the Pacific. Today we face increasing challenges of a global nature, such as unprecedented displacement, natural disasters and pandemics, just to name uh, a few. Perhaps more than at any other time in our modern history, one of the biggest challenges our two countries face is not only how we deliver ODA, but more importantly, how we win public legitimacy for this work. Polling in 2017 in Australia found that almost three out of four people felt the government spent either too much or about the right amount on ODA. We also have a discrepancy in perceptions domestically with 80% of the development sector believing we should spend more on ODA, but only 10% of regular Australians think the same. There is a similar story, I understand, here in the UK, uh, according to Bond for International Development and some of your newspaper outlets. We both agree that ODA is not charity. It represents an investment in our collective future by our taxpayers, which is a story. That's the story that we need to tell. As Minister, I have made it my personal priority to improve the way that we communicate to the Australian public, not only why and how we deliver ODA, but most importantly, what is the direct benefit to Australia and Australians of spending overseas development assistance. And I know that here the leaders in the UK are also um, doing the same. However, when we do look at the sort of statistics that we're seeing in countries like Australia, I think that we do have a way to go. Now, diasporas can help advocate, an OD, um, help advocate our ODA programs. Um, and ODA programs that both benefits their country of origin and build stronger links within Australia or the UK. And it makes sense for this engagement, particularly given that remittances significantly outstrip donor contributions. For example, in 2016, Australian Diaspora sent approximately $2.5 billion to the Pacific alone. The African Australia Australians remit about $1 billion to Africa. The UK and Australia share a commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. However, it is important that the SDGs not be perceived as some form of world government, but are contemporary manifestation, they are the contemporary manifestation of what we in Australia term a fair go. Um, this is a term that really does mean um, quite a lot um, to Australians and that's really what it is. Um, advocacy of the SDGs is critical to the success of our work because achieving the goals um, set out in the 2030 agenda will give us a safer, more stable world, an objective clearly in the national interest of both our countries. We are looking forward to presenting our first voluntary national review at the United Nations High Level Political Forum in July this year. Speaking of the United Nations, we both invest significant taxpayer money in the multilateral systems that are supposed to protect and promote international rules that support stability, prosperity and enable cooperation to tackle challenges that affect us all. Supporting international rules and institutions and being a good international citizen is becoming more important in an increasingly contested world. Australians, Australia's foreign policy white paper notes that, and I quote, the United Nations system is frequently cumbersome and sometimes responds too slowly to urgent challenges. 
These limitations do not inspire confidence in taxpayers when we invest their money, which is why we are such strong partners and drivers for UN reform. I was pleased to participate in the UK-led multilateral forum discussions. Lunchtime conferences in the United Kingdom have met midnight conferences for me on the other side of the world. But the point being, it does underscore that the commitment that Australia has to these reforms. Now, our joint approach is to use our taxpayer contributions and influence as a firm incentive to drive UN accountability, efficiency and effectiveness um, that is so desperately needed if we are to address the significant challenges we face. Now, a critical issue that the United Nations must urgently address is sexual exploitation and abuse by its staff in humanitarian situations. This behaviour is not only appalling, but completely undermines public confidence in UN institutions. We welcome Secretary Mordaunt's leadership on this critical issue, and I was pleased to co-sign a letter with Australia's Foreign Minister and other donors to the United Nations Secretary General calling for action to address this shocking abuse of power. Australia has had sound safeguards and child protection policies in place for some years, but is nevertheless seeking assurances that UN agencies, our NGO partners and our contractors all meet their contractual obligations and actively work to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse in any program using our ODA. The UK and Australia have similar approaches to humanitarian emergencies and disaster relief on the ground. In November last year, we signed a memorandum of understanding to work more collaboratively on humanitarian responses. We both believe strongly that the best outcomes in disaster relief come from drawing heavily on the skills, experience and perspectives of the local communities actually involved. That is something that we are seeing more and more in the Indo-Pacific as governments increasingly control um, the responses to their own um, uh, natural disasters. And from an Australian perspective, we have invested um, in building capacity in the National Disaster Management Offices of a number of our Pacific partners, and most especially in Fiji, Vanuatu and Tonga, which have taken responsibility for coordinating um, their own disasters in recent times. Now, that shift is particularly critical for many Pacific Island islands as they look to deal more and more with the consequences of climate change, which of course is a multiplier for existing vulnerabilities. Given its importance to our region, um, our white paper identified a step up in our engagement with the Pacific as one of our top five foreign policy goals endorsed by our Prime Minister at the 2016 Pacific Island Forum Leaders Meeting. The UK and Australia have a real interest in working together on disasters, particularly given the vast distances between our two countries. In the time it would take Australia to send specialists to a crisis in Africa, for example, Difford is likely already there with a response well underway. Likewise, when the UK wants to help Pacific Island nations struck by cyclones, it makes sense to partner with Australia. When the Philippines were de devastated by cyclone Haiyan in 2013, for example, doctors from the UK worked with an Australian-run field hospital for the first time. In the same spirit, Australian health professionals supported UK leadership in Sierra Leone during the 2014 Ebola crisis. Further collaboration of this kind can only streamline the mechanics of responding to humanitarian crises. Both countries are putting a greater emphasis on managing risks posed by natural hazards in our ODA programs as we work to become more climate and disaster resilient under the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Whilst we stand in strong partnership, 
There are some initiatives which we could learn from, for example, the UK's Disaster Emergency Com Committee, which has provided a single platform for British NGOs to launch collective appeals for humanitarian crises. Recently, in response to the recent Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh and Myanmar, our government, Australian government, supported a joint appeal in partnership with eight leading NGOs, which was supported by our public broadcasters as well as leading media organisations. It was, for us, an impressive success, uh, raising uh, over $10 million over a four-week period, including uh, $5 million in matched funding from the Australian government. So. We're looking um, towards the success of what the British have done in this space and we hope to replicate that. Another critical area where we share strong common philosophy is disability inclusion, particularly since we ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities a decade ago. Australia has for the past two years co-chaired the Global Action on Disability Network, known as GLAD, which the UK was instrumental in founding. Later this year, the UK will join Australia as co-chair of GLAD, and this renewed and welcome commitment to GLAD demonstrates the increased prioritisation of disability through UK's ODA program, which is being driven by Secretary Mordaunt. So too is the UK's initiative to host, alongside the Government of, of Kenya and the International Disability Alliance, a global disability summit here in London in July. The summit is an important opportunity to bring global attention to an often neglected issue. Australia is actively supporting the event, including by facilitating participation from disabled people's organisations uh, from our region. I would like to now turn to some opportunities where I think we could work more closely with the UK post-Brexit. In 2017, the European Union and its member states provided over 75 billion euros in official development assistance. Of this, the UK provided US dollars, $17.9 billion, and that's in 2017 in ODA. On the 9th of April, um, the uh, statistics um, show that the UK is the, um, in April some statistics were released which show that the UK is the third largest development assistance uh, donor after the US and Germany. Now with half the population of the Commonwealth uh, being in India and 94% in Asia and Africa combined, um, there will be many cogs, uh, I believe, in in the wheel of a revitalised Commonwealth. Such are the opportunities for our two countries that leaders on both sides are currently looking at our trading relationship and seizing on new opportunities for free trade agreements. An Australia-UK trade working group will be meeting this month. We also have the opportunity for new partnerships in the Indo-Pacific as Britain exits the EU. It will naturally be looking for new partners and markets. With rising levels of influence in the Indo-Pacific, the UK's ODA priorities may be better utilised in a different direction. The Foreign Commonwealth Office estimates that the UK currently accounts for around 15% of EU development funding to the Pacific, or approximately £13 million out of a total of £86 million in EU funding to the Pacific in 2015. The UK's commitment to the Private Infrastructure Development Group has largely been directed towards projects in Africa, South and Southeast Asia. We think the time is now right to direct more of these funds to a potential um, private infrastructure development group Pacific window. And uh, I'm sure that we'll talk a little bit more about the Pacific in our panel discussion. But in conclusion, uh, Australia, I just wanted to say that our two countries share so much when it comes to our perspective on so many different things, but very much on the issue of overseas development assistance and its objective of making our world a better place. 
no one country and no one agency working alone can meet the challenges that we face today. And so we count ourselves lucky to have such a close and long-standing friend like the United Kingdom to navigate, navigate this increasingly complex and fast-changing uh, world and the many challenges um, that it is bringing particularly when it comes to our approach on development, our shared beliefs in freedom, in democracy, in the international rules-based order, binds us together towards a common central goal of a stable, secure and prosperous world. These virtues are the bedrock upon which our two nations were built. It is in this week, as the UK hosts the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, during uncertain times, that I find relevance in a speech made by Queen Elizabeth many years ago. Speaking on her 21st birthday in Cape Town, a year and a half after the end of the Second World War, about the anxiety and hardships that the war had left behind, she said this, if we all go forward together with an unwavering faith, a high courage and a quiet heart, we shall be able to make of this ancient Commonwealth an even grander thing, more free, more prosperous, more happy and a more powerful influence for good in the world that it has been in the greatest days of our forefathers. I think this quote is as relevant um, today as it was all those years ago. Together as like-minded partners and as a Commonwealth, we must continue standing up for peace, prosperity and opportunity within our ODA programs and beyond. Um, can I thank you very much for the opportunity, Alex, of being here uh, this afternoon and just to highlight some of these points of collaboration between Australia and the UK and where potentially um, this friendship, this partnership, um, this long-standing connection um, can be taken um, to even uh, greater levels uh, into the future. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Uh, you. That was a great introduction. Uh, Australia has clearly been through a searching period and come out with a new vision, not only for international development, but this broader white paper. Um, and it comes, um, maybe you didn't plan it, but at a moment uh, when uh, obviously the UK is also thinking about its future in a dramatic fashion, and that has brought the Commonwealth in as well. So. In a moment of uncertainty, we also have opportunity for new relationships, new vision, uh, and probably some new challenges to address together. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have Albert Mariner here. Uh, again, Albert is the head of Europe, Asia, Caribbean, and Pacific team, which I guess means he never sleeps. Mm -hmm. Um, like, the, like, like the former British Empire, um, uh, in the political section of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, and prior to joining the Commonwealth Secretariat in 2014, uh, Albert was a senior United Nations Peace and Development Advisor uh, for UNDP's multi-country office in Fiji. Um, so coming uh, directly from uh, the field and into this, it'll be a good opportunity. I'm going to turn over to Albert for a couple minutes of reflections uh, on the speech and what's going on, and then I'll moderate a conversation uh, between you. Thanks, Alex. Well, I did have a set uh, remarks to make, but perhaps, you know, I can just... Uh, my focus, of course, would have been on uh, Commonwealth engagement in the Pacific. I've been asked to highlight uh, some of the recent activities that the Commonwealth has pursued in the Pacific uh, to enhance member states, the 11 Commonwealth member states, you know, in, in terms of their adherence to our political and fundamental values. These values, of course, are outlined in the Commonwealth Charter that was signed by Her Majesty the Queen in 2013. Um, Australia, of course, is a, a key member of the Commonwealth and a, a key donor to our programs. And so a lot of our engagement in that part of the world, in the Pacific and other regions of the Commonwealth, we do rely not only on Australia, but our key member states to be partners in carrying forward some of these uh, activities. 
The Pacific, of course, 11 of the Commonwealth leaders of the Pacific will all be here in London. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the only three female head of government was a member of the Pacific, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. So it's an exciting time for the Commonwealth, which is, this is one of the key priority areas for us, is encouraging women to participate in political processes. Unfortunately, in the Pacific, that has the lowest percentage of female in parliament, the national parliament. So the Commonwealth, with uh, Australia and others, we've been trying to encourage uh, the executive to find ways and election management bodies to find ways to allow and provide a conducive environment for women to participate in these processes. Youth in particular, of the 2.4 billion citizens of the Commonwealth, 60% are on the age of uh, 30 and below. So there's a huge uh, proportion of youth within the organization and we're very keen to explore and work in partnership with our member states to provide avenues for the youth to engage in their development. So I guess I'll leave it at that, Alex, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but like I said, okay. I, did have a, I did have a set of remarks you said, but I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Well, great. Um, why don't I uh, use this opportunity to elicit further thoughts from, from, from both of you. Um, let, let's start out with a big picture issue, I think, from both of you, because we're here at the beginning of this week on the Commonwealth, and there's a lot of talk about revitalization of the Commonwealth. And I think a lot of people are asking themselves, what is the relevance of this organization? What can it do that other gatherings of communities uh, don't do? You mentioned something about values. Interestingly, in your speech, you mentioned something about the need for UN reform. And I, I, it, it might be interesting for us to hear a little bit about what, what do you invest in terms of your hopes in this organization and what can it achieve uh, that's greater than, than what it's been uh, doing recently? Look, um, I think f the Commonwealth is an important institution, um, certainly from the Indo-Pacific uh, area, 36 of the 53 uh, countries of the Commonwealth are in our area. Um, this is a large family. It's a family that's bound by um, a tradition, um, a rules-based order, democracy, a common language, and often common ways of doing legal systems, things that um, bind us um, together and therefore make us understand what happens in different countries. And I think just like a family um, interacts, um, I think that the Commonwealth family has the opportunity, I think uh, particularly in a post-Brexit uh, world for Britain in particular to interact a lot more with its um, Commonwealth countries. Certainly, uh, I think in the Indo-Pacific area, which is one of the fastest growing areas uh, in the world, there are opportunities uh, post-Brexit, and I think that those opportunities mean that Britain's engagement to a greater extent with its Commonwealth countries potentially will be of benefit to Britain, but it will also be of benefit to the Commonwealth. Uh, so I do see a good future uh, for the Commonwealth. I'm a supporter of the Commonwealth, and Australia is a supporter of the Commonwealth, and we, you know, financially and, and, and in many different ways. And I think that, you know, as I said today, um, Australia uh, can potentially do a lot more uh, with Britain, uh, particularly post-Brexit, and I think that the Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth, um, as a family, um, I feel to some extent that we have an obligation to help other family members, um, to learn from them, to work with them, and to uh, ensure that um, uh, you know our objective of a better world is one where uh, that's a better world in our Commonwealth. Mm. Let me come back to the United Nations, but let, first, uh, Albert, do you have some thoughts about uh, the the view of the future of the Commonwealth and its relevance going forward? I think it's, you know, we current uh, uncertainties in the in the world right now. I think, and with uh, Theresa May now at the incoming chair in office, and she will take over from Prime Minister Mark, uh, Musket of Malta. So, of course, as Senator has referred to, you know, her tenure in office as chair of the Commonwealth will coincide with the ongoing Brexit process. So there's huge potential there for the Commonwealth. Of course, uh, 
you know, we always re we must remember that, you know, 31 of the 53 member states of the Commonwealth are small, are, are small states. And this is 31 of the 37 small states in the UN system. So the Commonwealth has always been seen as as the champion of small states issues. It's an organization that has amplified the voices of small states. Australia is a, one of our key funders to, uh, you know, key projects that are tangible evidence of the Commonwealth uh, in support to small states. And that's our joint office facilities in New York and at Geneva. This allows and facilitates uh, representation of our small states to the UN system and to WTO. So, I guess, uh, and, for, and also for the small leaders of uh, the small leaders of the small island states of the Commonwealth, they always see this opportunity of Trogan, whereby they will come to 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 interact and engage with some of you know members of you know like the UK, Canada, and where the key challenges to them, such as trade, climate change, oceans, will be the opportunity for them to raise them. And uh, I think uh, the Commonwealth has a great future ahead of itself. And also, I noticed that one of the things that has dominated the media, especially in the UK, is who will be the next head of the Commonwealth. Now, that's another interesting uh, issue, but that, of course, is something that the heads themselves will, will discuss. Let's stick with this theme of, of small island states. So obviously, a big part of the white paper and your speech is this Australia's increasing focus on its region and on the Pacific. Um, and a lot of that, of course, is about small island states and the challenges. Can you give us a little bit more of a tangible feel of what that means for Australia? What does it mean for how your aid programs are going to be changing in response to the needs of those communities? Well, Australia has consistently supported small island developing states, SIDS. And as Albert has said, um, countries like Australia, I mean, we're very supportive of the Geneva and the New York offices because that gives small island states the opportunity to participate at the international forum. And that's enabling not just um, an office somewhere where the logistics of all of that um, can be uh, helped, but also assisting participation of people. And so one of the things that Australia has consistently done is assisted people from our region to participate uh, in international fora. That's really important because it's one thing to ask or have participation at a regional level and we've done that as well like recently uh, as part of the COP23 a process uh, we supported Fiji as the president having the presidency of COP23 and so we supported regional consultation and that's very important to bring civil society and all sorts of people together but there's another thing for countries to participate at the international level and so um, on that front. Um, we're very, very pleased to do that. What does it practically mean in our region? Well, Australia has um, st indicated its step up engagement uh, in the Pacific, and that's across a whole range of different things. I mean, uh, as I uh, mentioned, our ODA is around $4 billion, of which 90% uh, is spent in the Indo-Pacific, a third of that directly in the Pacific. And that's on a whole range of things, whether it's education, health, governance, um, climate, um, gender, uh, we have cross-cutting gender, uh, spend, uh, disability, a whole range of things. But today, the challenges that um, a region like the Pacific faces is very different. When we talk about, um, I call it small s security, uh, we have issues in relation to unregulated, illegal and unreported fishing very important because of course fishing is vitally important for um, the Pacific. In fact, um, a large percentage of the world's consumption of tuna actually comes from uh, our region. So we also have, we might have small states but they are very large um, um, maritime countries. They have huge um, EZs and which means that, for example, a country like Kiribati, 
might have a, a very small population, a very small land mass, but has an enormous EZ. So with that comes challenges in relation to surveillance and security. And so therefore, as part of the step up, we, what, we've, uh, what we're looking at is a broader um, security framework, which comes out of what we've done as part of our regional assistance mission in the Pacific. So today, what are the challenges that we're facing? On top of the sort of issues that that we've discussed, you've then got transnational crime, uh, you've got the, the route between Australia and the, uh, and the United States is now increasingly becoming a trafficking, drug trafficking route. So you've got issues with um, uh, people trafficking, uh, you've got a whole range of issues, cyber, all of these issues which compound the vulnerabilities that a lot of the small island states are facing in our region. And so therefore our engagement as the largest donor in the area is across a whole range of fronts. It goes from effectively A to Z. Um, and as the largest donor, it's like having the biggest house in the street, Alex. When you've got the biggest house in the street, there is a responsibility. Um, to help your neighbours, and Australia is very willing to help our neighbours. And for that reason, that's why our aid is targeted in our region, and most especially in the Pacific. So as part of our step up, we have looked at a whole range of different areas right across the spectrum uh, in terms of assisting uh, in the Pacific. Mm. Albert, you, you are from the Pacific. You've worked recently in other parts. Uh, you are now responsible for it. What are some of the particular challenges? I mean, many of these states are not the poorest, uh, but they have special development challenges. Can you give us a little bit of an insight today, looking forward, about what are the big things that are animating people in the region that, that you're having to focus on or want to focus on? Yeah, uh, from my side of the house and the Commonwealth Secretariat, we focus very much on the, uh, on the values of the organization. And this has to do with, you know, democracy, rule of law, human rights. So we work a lot in that field and a lot of the, uh, the most recent activities we've been engaged in is uh, deploying observer missions to uh, countries' uh, national elections. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've had teams in the Pacific, uh, both Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Tonga, and um, Solomon Islands. So these uh, groups, of course, when they're deployed, they're usually led by eminent citizens of the Commonwealth, former heads of state, former foreign ministers, supported by a wide range of experts across the Commonwealth. And what we find that in a lot of these island states, um, you know, they, we must work on the basis that a lot of the engagement in terms of enhancing the Commonwealth values is giving them time. There's a lot of uh, their own cultures and their own traditions that feeds into their mindsets, how they interact with the institutions. But they truly believe that by owning and, you know, participating in their, demo in their democratic processes, therefore they, it could lead to very strengthened and accountable institutions. And I think that's the key. Uh, leaders, political, those who participate in political processes in the small island countries must recognize that everyone must have a say. Everyone must believe in the democratic processes and everyone must have a say in how their institutionals are built and therefore they should be able to invest in them. For, for them to have the confidence in strong institutions, it has that multiplier effect whereby outsiders could see that there is confidence in the process, confidence in the institutions and foreign investment could come in. But of course, uh, you know, the Pacific also is as now uh, the most recent phenomenon in the Pacific is new actors. Australia and New Zealand have always been strong traditional partners of these member countries in the Pacific. And now you have India, you have Indonesia, you got China. So therefore it, be, it has an interesting mix and in how national governments interact with these different actors coming in. It's a, it provides a very interesting uh, debate and I'm sure Senator, uh, the minister from Australia will have views on that. But for us in the Commonwealth, it's always working in partnership with the government of the day. We try, of course, and involve other stakeholders, civil society. We try and work with our Commonwealth partners like Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. So it's a whole heap of work. It, you know, it's wide ranging, but at the same time, you know, exciting but challenging. Hmm. Well, I think it's a good uh, segue to talk maybe about a couple of geopolitical issues. Um, let's talk about China. Uh, Obviously, China is a, is a big issue for everyone. 
Uh, I'd say it's an especially big issue for Australia, uh, given your proximity and some of the engagement in the last couple of years. I, I'm curious, or, or do you see at this moment uh, China as a development cooperation partner? Do you have a partnership with them? Do you see them as a competitor? What sorts of partnership and or concerns do you have about the ways in which China is increasingly operating as uh, a uh, lender uh, or partner to many of the countries uh, in the region? Look, can I just say, um, we obviously welcome uh, development partners. We welcome investment by uh, a broad range of partners, uh, particularly uh, in our region. I think the important thing is that we we look at the priorities of the different countries, uh, but and we uh, look at uh, positive and productive uh, engagement and investment, but we do not increase the debt burden. I think that's really important that we come at it from that perspective. On the issue of partnership, I mean, uh, we work with different partners uh, in our region. Uh, we work with um, um, the World Bank, we work with the Asian Development Bank, uh, we work with China, we work with Japan, we work with France, we work with other donors um, in different ways. Uh, for example, let me just give you a, a couple of examples of partnerships. Um, uh, France, uh, Australia and New Zealand have a very strong partnership, particularly in response to humanitarian disaster, uh, which we do happen to have quite a few in our region because it's a very disaster prone area. And so uh, we work very strongly in, in that space. Um, on the uh, One of the things that increasingly we are now seeing is more policy driven uh, lending, for, particularly by the banks, and we have a partnership, for example, in relation to tackling malaria uh, between um, one of the banks, uh, China and Australia. So there are ways that we can cooperate. The point really, though, is to ensure that our investments uh, are such that we do not increase debt burdens on already vulnerable states. That really is the important point, and uh, certainly a point that I've made, and a point that is now, um, there's a public debate that's been going uh, in relation to this issue, and we do need to take, development partners need to take into account the economic vulnerability uh, of the country uh, that they are seeking to assist. The other thing is, of course, you do need to look at it from uh, there's aid and there's, um, there are, there's aid in the form of grants and then there's loans with whatever, whatever terms are attached to that loan or there you know, could be a combination. So you really do have to look at and bring all of those things um, into the equation. Well, I think about... Uh 15 years or so after the last big uh, debt forgiveness campaign, a lot of people are raising alarm bells now about indebtedness, so it's good to hear that you are focused on that. Um, Albert, the, staying with China, China's obviously not in the Commonwealth, uh, India is, uh, as many of China's near neighbors are as well. Uh, and as you've emphasized a couple of times, the Commonwealth has a kind of values-based, governance-based uh, prescription to membership, uh, which requires dem democracy and the rule of law. So to what extent does that put the Commonwealth at all in confrontation with China and the region? How do you handle that relationship? Well, as you say, the, uh, China is not a member of the Commonwealth, but uh, uh, India, of course, is one of the uh, key players in that part of the world. Uh, the Secretary General uh, undertook a visit. Uh, to India, and uh, the outcome of that visit was quite uh, encouraging in terms of India's commitment to support the work of the Commonwealth in our small states. And so that conversation now between the Secretariat and uh, and Delhi is ongoing on how best we could uh, work with uh, India to provide support to small states. Uh, obviously, a lot of the Commonwealth small states, not only in the Pacific Caribbean, have their own uh, bilateral relations with China, and so that's something that we don't get involved with. But we do uh, support our, you know, our small member states in terms of, um, you know, providing capacity. How do they manage their debt? How do they record 
capacity building exercises in, in regards to accessing, uh, you know, one of the things that recently um, have we launched with support of Australia, of course, is the Climate Finance Access Hub. Of course, uh, with that project now in place, uh, this came out of Malta, the Trogum in Malta, we'll likely, uh, probably in the next few months, we'll have five advisors in the Pacific uh, helping uh, small member states accessing all these money that, you know, se several institutions have to address their vulnerability and adapta adaptation uh, programs to address climate change. But China, we kind of stay, uh, stay kind of observed from afar, but we do note that China is becoming a key player in a different, not just in the small states, but in Africa as well. So it's something that we do uh, uh, take note of. Mm. Just yeah, say, please. The, the importance, of course, is that um, the investment be a productive investment, um, whether it's, you know, infrastructure with a productive end, um, investment, for example, if it's a, an education um, uh, objective or a health objective, uh, that there is some productive end to the investment. And I think that's really where it's very important, particularly with um, our small island states uh, uh, in the Pacific. Um, again, uh, with that, the comment that I made before of not um, imposing um, heavy uh, debt burden mm. so that um, from Australia's perspective, for example, one of the things that we've done um, is um, set ourselves a target for aid for trade. So in other words, assistance that has a productive end, whether it might be in terms of um, deregulating your or, or, or regulations pertinent to customs, export regulations, whatever, something like that. Or alternatively, um, when we look at um, uh, on the gender front, and I think you mentioned gender before, we've set ourselves a target of 80% of our aid um, has to be for gender related frameworks. So in other words, uh, we're very pleased that last year we achieved about 78%. So what does that practically mean? Let me give you a very good example. Uh, in one of the countries where I visited, um, solar, of course, solar is becoming uh, more important. And uh, there was a solar farm that was being established. And uh, over half of the people who had set up the solar farm were women. Uh, and indeed, um, a growing number of the technicians in this particular power company were females. And when I recently visited Tonga, uh, where we switched off the generators after the last cyclone that had happened, um, there were five or six women working as part of that team that switched off the power. My point is, when you start thinking, how can I make my project more gender focused? How can I make my project meet a particular criteria, it makes people start thinking outside the box, start thinking outside the way we've normally done things in the past. And so we're very pleased that this gender target has actually achieved a far greater involvement of women in our aid uh, programs. Um, a lot more exposure, a lot more uh, women have participated than they would have in the past had we not put that target in. Yeah, that's great. It's a lot of lessons to be learned from the value of focusing on those sorts of issues right. to actually really make well, them happen. When you do put those sort of parameters on it, it does make people um, focus. How can I turn this particular investment into a much more gender-focused mm. investment? And, and we've seen that people can do that. They will do it because they start thinking outside the box. Mm. Uh, I'm going to ask one or two more questions before going out to the audience. We also have some people uh, coming in online, so that's good. So please do send us your sure. questions. Um, let's talk about climate change for a minute, because obviously it's a huge issue uh, for the Pacific, uh, a place already having to deal with storms and disasters, uh, rising sea levels. Um, it does not paint a pretty picture. Uh, in some places, this is even... Uh, although this is a, an overused term, an existential crisis, we are starting to see climate refugees, um, and that unfortunately is only likely to continue. Um, so I'd like to ask you both a little bit about how does that uh, how does that affect your thinking about the future and where and how you make investments? Yeah. The solar power is obviously a great one, yeah. uh, but uh, you know as we often say here, unfortunately those most affected by climate change are often the ones least responsible for causing it. 
Um, and so I wonder if solar power uh, on Pacific Islands is a great thing, but a little too late for uh, some of the big challenges that they face. Uh, look, uh Again, just like gender, climate is one of the cross-cutting um, uh, issues uh, as part of our uh, ODA. Um, as part of our uh, Pacific, uh, sorry, as part of our uh, Paris Agreement commitment, Australia committed one billion dollars, uh, of which um, uh, three hundred million over four years was specifically towards climate-related uh, uh, issues, uh, particularly in the Pacific. Now, what does that? actually mean. It means the practicalities of um, uh, programs for adaptation and for mitigation. And so that might mean construction of seawalls. It might mean part of assisting for water management or sewage management or something like that. Those practical day-to-day -day things that mean um, important uh, important things for communities. Also, uh, Australia was co-chair of the Green Climate Fund for two years, and so that meant that we were able to assist particularly Pacific Island countries in ensuring that they applied to the Green Climate Fund for funding, and we were very pleased to see quite a number of projects that were um, accepted uh, by the Green Climate Fund in terms of um, uh, different adaptation and mitigation um, uh, programs. So uh, that's the practical things, and we think that um, that's a good way of assisting our Pacific Island countries. Now, for example, I went to Kiribati, a country which is quite low lying. Um, storm surges create issues in relation to water and affecting the quality of the water. So therefore, uh, you build um, or you erect tanks on stilts. Uh, you know, this is just practical things, but for that community, um, that was really important. And so therefore, they have a supply of water uh, and, um, and it's very important for them and for growing their crops and those sort of things. Just a little example, but they're the sort of practical things that we've turned our mind in terms of some of the work that we've done uh, in the Pacific. Mm. Albert, Fiji's presidency was obviously of the, of the last COP, was in part given the power of their particular situation. You were living there recently. Um, how, how dire is the potential impact of, of climate change in, in the coming uh, period of time, decade or so, uh, for some of these countries? It's, you know, if you look at some of the small island countries in the Pacific, like Tuvalu and Kiribati, the impact is already there. It's not a threat anymore. It's happening. And I think it was uh, former UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon that went to Kiribati, and that completely transformed his views on climate change, because he saw firsthand that this is real. So Fiji is, is doing, a, a, you know, playing this leadership role uh, in, uh, for COP, but also, you know, uh, support, of course, from the region. And uh, it's something that uh, the Commonwealth is, is very much uh, alive to, and that's why we've got this project now, the Climate Finance Access Hub, whereby we've got experts to be deployed help uh, you know these small island countries provide capacity in drawing up projects because as we all know there's billions are locked up in these all these climate finance available accessing them is a real challenge now, so as i mentioned before we've got five uh, countries in the pacific who have uh, asked us for support and we're now uh, preparing our experts to be deployed and help them uh, support capacity is such a, a, a challenge in the small countries uh, and uh, and I think we'll have the Prime Minister of Tuvalu and the President of Kiribati who will be here at Chogum, <laughs> and we'll get to hear that they mm. will be advocating for more more attention and more support to their efforts in terms of their mitigation and uh, adaptation uh, process mm. that are in place. Is there a dynamic within the Commonwealth? I mean, it not only includes some of these small countries that are dealing with the impacts of climate change, but some of the world's biggest polluters. Uh, United States is not in it, but I'll say that because I'm from the United States. Obviously, the UK, Australia, India, uh, a lot of the challenges may be caused by them. Is there a dynamic of political dialogue within the Commonwealth about how the heavy polluting industrialized countries need to move faster to, to, to save the planet? There's always, that dynamic is always there. I mean, if we look at the, uh, the meeting in Malta, um, 
and how you know the Commonwealth uh, members tried to bring India on board because India had reservations about the whole pre-Paris conversation. But through their Commonwealth conversation and discussions, they managed to find a consensus before they went to Paris. So again, you know, this you know, the, the common language is such a critical uh, asset to the Commonwealth organization and its members. But of course, you know, different countries at their different phases of development, so that issue will always be there. But I think there's that determination that they've got to honor the Paris Agreement and the Commonwealth remains, you know, in support of all our member states and trying to uh, work through these issues with them. Can yeah. I just add one of the practical things um, that uh, the Pacific is doing through the auspices of the Pacific Island Forum uh, is, of course, um, preparedness for disasters. Um, uh, uh, we are in the process uh, through the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, the leaders adopted a framework for uh, resilience and disaster preparedness so that as part of this, um, we prepare better. Uh, because, of course, uh, that means that the next disaster, and we know that there'll be another a cyclone or um, some other disaster that's going to happen. So it's important that countries do prepare. Now, that framework, um, when it is finalised, will take into account the framework of Sendai. It will take into account uh, very uh, the uh, sustainable development goals uh, and will be a, a unique framework for the Pacific but um, the hope being that we will be able to roll it out across the Pacific and so prepare and have those levels of preparedness in those little communities, in those islands, so that the next time um, they will be better prepared. We are seeing um, a greater empowerment by countries in terms of preparing um, their own uh, disaster management because that's one of the things that's really important. Albert touched on it, but. You cannot underestimate the power of capacity building in these countries. Um, it's important that countries do, um, in, in, in creating and, and increasing the capacity of their countries to deal with disasters, um, it, it then flows through to the communities and therefore that, that greater awareness. So it's a multifaceted, multi-layered uh, approach in terms of assisting. So it's capacity building, it's pre-positioning uh, pre of stores, it's a whole combination of factors that we um, as larger countries in the, in the Pacific can assist uh, in doing this. But in the end, um, it needs to be a coordinated framework in terms of how do you deal with disasters and then um, you know, how do you build back better so that next time you're not going to lose mm. the school hall, you're not going to lose the schools, you're not going to lose those things. So that's all part of it. So it's it's the big picture, but then there's the detail and the <laughs> at that grassroots level right across this vast um, area of, of ocean. Yeah. We, we here at ODI have done a lot of work uh, over the years on disaster risk reduction and the incredible yeah. value of those investments. In fact, uh, tomorrow, he, we have here uh, on this stage the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And when you look at Bangladesh's record of being able to deal with issues like perennial flooding uh, and the damage that it caused, loss of life, economic damage, and how radically that has been yeah. reduced yeah. in the last couple of decades, the, the numbers are just astonishing. Well, well, we know that for, uh, and I'm just going off the top of my head now, I think it's for every dollar um, of uh, investment in preparedness, it's a $15 saving down track. So, so we are talking, uh, you know, $1 of investment and in preparedness uh, really does give dividends uh, down track. And, and ultimately, that can only help the bottom line uh, of the countries because, of course, often, and, and we're seeing it this week, uh, for example, we've just had cyclone, uh, Josie went through Fiji and now there's another cyclone uh, the week after uh, going through and, I mean, so that's, you get on top and then after Cyclone Winston, and of course uh, we saw that uh, in Fiji, Winston, and then the year after we've had two or three others and so one thing compounds on another. But hopefully those schools that we built back better as a consequence of Winston aren't going to fall this time. 